Good afternoon and welcome. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Welcome to VIA Voices. I'm John Fanestel, Executive Director here at VIA International. On behalf of the entire VIA team, we welcome you. Glad you, you're with us. We're continuing our exploration of uh, the work of VIA International. Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at VIA's work in community development and in global education. And today we're gonna to be turning our attention to uh, the work that we're calling the VIA Borderlands Institute. But as with preceding weeks, we're gonna uh, approach this conversation organically, looking a little bit at the history, uh, the different kinds of conversations that have developed around VIA's work in the San Diego, Tijuana, California, Baja California borderlands, and the different kinds of um, uh, projections or strategies or ideas that have swirled around the idea of, of what an institute for the borderlands uh, would be and what unique contribution a VIA borderlands institute could make uh, here to our uh, borderlands uh, communities and borderlands peoples. So we're very glad to have you with us and welcome. And as in the preceding weeks, we're gonna be uh, uh, sharing the conversation. I'll be sharing the conversation with uh, Elisa Sabatini, our uh, president and CEO of VIA and with Rigoberto Reyes, our senior program officer. I'm just uh, bringing them into the spotlight. And then also with Jim Gerber, our uh, newest board member and uh, retired uh, professor of Latin American studies from San Diego State. So Rigo, Elisa, Jim, welcome. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Que sigue la conversación. <laughs> we, we continue the conversation. Uh, and uh, once again, I, I look forward to learning uh, more. I, I, I've been with VIA now for just over a year, but I learn every day. And I, I look forward to learning again today. Um, perhaps Elisa and Rigo, uh, you can once again help us understand a little bit about the roots and the history, specifically of this conversation around uh, Borderlands Institute. And I'm just curious to know, when did the conversation about an institute first emerge and in what context? What were the ideas at that time when it first cropped up that, hey, we could establish an institute? What, what, what would that original vision have looked like? Well, maybe Elisa could start in a sense that uh, we took a trip to Mexico City. I can't remember how long ago, probably about 20 years ago or so where we originated, we, we were introduced to, to this particular concept, which is not a new concept, but it was the first time that I, for myself, I had seen it. Uh, this is the first time that I had seen something like that. So maybe Elisa, if you could share with us as far as the, uh, the, the context of that, of that uh, trip that we took to Mexico City. Well, I certainly remember that trip very well. We, um... I guess my, my idea at the time, I had joined uh, it, then Los Niños, um, maybe not even a year before. And I was very interested to have our team meet and learn from people that I had worked with prior in different parts of Mexico. And, um, you know, ultimately in Guatemala as well. But, um, and so we traveled to Mexico City and we had some extraordinary meetings and visits and then were invited by a wonderful colleague of ours, um, a man named uh, Javier, to uh, visit this program in Cuernavaca. We traveled out to, to this center, which was essentially an old hacienda. And maybe, Rigo, you can take it from there and speak about that experience. Yes, definitely. Uh, for me, it was a very eye-opening experience as far as some of the work that I had been doing. This particular, actually, they call it Instituto. I don't remember the the, the full title of uh, of the group itself, but basically, what it was, it was kind of like an NGO uh, overseeing many, many grassroots initiatives throughout the area. And those initiatives were anything from uh, indigenous women that were trying to develop a, a small uh, microcredit uh, initiative uh, amongst many, many other, other, other grassroots initiatives in, the, in, in that particular area. The essence, the essence of, the, um, of, of the NGO was basically was like a hub, like a hub of, of uh, different NGOs that don't have resources or so different grassroots organizations that don't have the resources to establish a, a, a nonprofit per se so this nonprofit was actually the hub for that. 
And in that particular in that particular institute, if you will, they had many many different services that were kind of like a in in house, and uh, they were so sufficient to a great extent. So within that, they have like a small painting shop. They had like a small store uh, for for arts and crafts that uh, that that uh, the indigenous women were producing, amongst many many other. So that that was to me to a, like a like a very interesting introduction and always kind of like injected the whole concept of the idea of developing something similar at that particular time in Tijuana because that was that was that was the 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 hub of artwork at least to that point. Yeah. One of the things that really got my eye and 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 basically because I was very familiar with it is some of the some of the strategies that they were developing. A lot of the strategies were coming from a, an organization. Who I'm, I'm familiar with that are actually based in Jalisco, in Guadalajara, Jalisco, which is uh, uh, an organization called INDEC, Instituto, Instituto Mexicano del Desarrollo Comunitario. I'm familiar with that because uh, a lot of the training that we did at the border were primarily a lot of the same concepts or a lot of the, uh, similar methodologies that they've been using in, in, in training people throughout Mexico and actually throughout Latin America. And actually, it was through them that we were able to uh, adopt, to a great extent, adopt uh, the methodology at the border. And I think, like I stated last week, uh, this particular methodology is, is primarily used in, in very rural areas. And, and for us, it was just a challenge in the sense that we wanted to adapt it into an into urban area and a border area at the same time. So that was kind of like a double, a double challenge, if you will. But in essence, that was kind of like, like the, the eye-opening uh, idea. And that's where a lot of the discussion and the dialogue started developing from, from that visit to, uh, to Cuernavaca. I guess the other, just to add to that, when we got back, I did my somewhat usual thing of looking for real estate. So we started looking for different uh, locations that might be a feasible, uh, site for this in, in Tijuana. We looked at various kind of large <clears throat> sprawling properties that we thought, you know, could be um, a site for this. And um, at, at one point in time, you know, considered how this could, could sort of play out. I'd also just add to what Rigo is saying is that when we had formalized this program of formation of outreach workers, which we had gotten certified by the Ibero-Americana University. Um, that really turned us to to be more of an educational organization rather than, you know, the people that were just operating a nutrition program in, in, in the border region. So this educational shift, which was starting to take place at uh, that period of time, also made us feel like, well, we could represent and do the things that we are good at and help others do those things. So um, I recall fondly when we changed the name of the organization to VIA in 2009. And I see here on our Zoom call, our former president, Jeanette Lear, who was the spearheader of changing that name and to VIA International, and then also considering how we could be educators of others um, with the, the, the methodologies that we had used, which, you know, we thought nutrition and ecology programs or microfinance programs, and then as well as this educational program for community leaders or community outreach workers. So, you know, where could we sort of be the, the trainer of trainers, if you will, and um, that included our international outreach programs that had by then expanded to other areas of the world. And we did secure contracts, various contracts to do work in Bolivia. We had a long-term um, contract with a program with the Ministry of Tourism in Jordan. And we also did an extensive uh, program of six weeks or so of Kind of analysis in Cambodia. So we did become very um, global, if you will, at that point in time with these sort of outreach contracts that we had to 
in a sense, teach our model. And um, I'm remiss in saying that I know exactly what's happened in those locations from, from our trainings at that time, because we, I also believe, learned that there was a lot to do right here in our own region. And we, in some ways, pivoted from that outreaching kind of external idea to more of the local idea, and particularly by the move that we made to Logan Heights in San Diego. And I want to ask specifically about that transition, Elisa, because as you've described it to me, so the, the formation of leaders and the training of leaders uh, in methods of community development, but then also, as Rigo mentioned, this uh, this uh, idea of incub almost incubating or housing or, or shepherding or you know uh, sheltering projects uh, in their organic development. Uh, as you've described it to me, when the organization really s settled in in uh, Barrio Logan, Rigo, of course, had long, long-standing roots in Barrio Logan, and so uh, some of those same practices, leadership development, uh, uh, nurturing of, of of emergent projects also started to, to happen in, in the barrio, in Barrio Logan. But as you've described it to me, in Barrio Logan, things look very different than they did in Tijuana as well. So uh, I don't know, what, what was, I, Rigo, and I, I was remiss, I meant to distribute to these folks before this conversation, the article that you've written, describing yourself as a barriologist. Uh, could you just tell people what, are, what is a barriologist and and what did it look like when you took this method and these ideas into the Barrio, uh, Barrio Logan or Logan Heights? Well, thank you for that question, John. I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, in a nutshell, as far as a barriologist, and, and I'm quite sure there's a very different definitions of it, depending where you're coming from. But for, for, for us in the neighborhood, it's basically uh, somebody that comes from, from, from the neighborhood somebody that comes from the streets. As a matter of fact, uh, jokingly, uh, rest in peace, Chunky Sanchez used to say that we were all graduates from the university or the streets. And in essence, that's where our experience comes from, is basically having lived through it. And sometimes we take for granted, and I say we in the sense that, that uh, particularly when we talk about academia, if you will, sometimes we take for granted as far as the knowledge and the wisdom that's already exist in our communities. Many times because we have the degrees, if you will, you have the degrees or you have the titles and so on and so forth, you become sort of like the expert. And a lot of times not take, paying attention to the wisdom that already exists in the grassroots. So having said that, I think in my particular case, I come from that school of, or the barrio, if you will, but at the same time, I'm not blind or naive in a sense that you need both. You need both the streetwise mentality, if you will, complemented by education. It's kind of like, a, a, I, I see it like a, a difference of between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. And essentially you need both. But in our particular case, because we don't have the resources, and, and by that I mean in the grassroots level, we don't have the resources quote unquote, to get educated, if you will. We don't have the titles per se, or, or, or the degrees, if you will, uh, but we do have the knowledge. So in essence, we come from that school of thought, if you will. So for me in a nutshell, that's how I would describe a barriologist. And so Rigo, you were learning and, ex and experiencing and developing these methods and, and, and implementing and, and developing, practicing these methods of development in the colonias of Tijuana but then especially as Via uh, established an office in Barrio Logan, those same methods uh, were uh, employed with, in the context of the barrios of San Diego, the, the neighborhoods and uh, you know, Mexican, historic Mexican, Mexican-American neighborhoods of San Diego. But things were very different in the barrio from the colonias of Tijuana. What, were, what, what do you recall as the striking differences as you, you know, kind of took these methods into a new context, the, the urban barrios of a, a major American city? Well, first of all, I take great pride as far as the work that we develop in the colonias of Tijuana. And for me, I think I mentioned it last week, it was, it was, uh, it was very fulfilling in a sense, kind of like going back to my own roots, if you will, in a sense, because I, I, was, born, I was born and raised here in, San, in, in the US, but yet having now been introduced or, or being 
put in a situation where I was working in colonias, it was, it was uh, for me, it was a very good learning experience. And again, trying to, trying to introduce some of the concepts and organizing skills that we had developed in, in Logan Heights specifically. Uh, but within that frame, we are, were also involved in adapting other methodologies. That's why I mentioned in DEC, as far as other things that were happening in, throughout Latin America and kind of combine it was a combination of both, I feel. Mm. And we were able to develop a, a strategy and a methodology focused primarily at the border setting, and particularly in Tijuana, Tecate, and Mexicali. And going to your question, as far as trying to come and introduce that particular experience here in this side of the border, one thing that we have to understand is how we understand promoción or promoción social which is the promotion is, is kind of like the, the whole methodology of working with community. Uh, here in the United States, and I got in trouble quite a bit because of it, I was already coming from the mentality of the experience that we had had across the border and also the experience of all Latin America and trying to, to introduce that particular concept here as promotoras or promotores. Here in the United States, the concept had been introduced and adopted but primarily adopted primarily by health, universities, uh, hospitals, more in the health setting. And that was pretty prevalent even today. It's that particular methodology is used today by primarily in that particular box, meaning the whole health concept of it. And our experience across the border was quite different. Whereas the promotion social, and social is kind of like the key element there, the key word, is that we would train people in the community for them to define what the issues or topics they were gonna be working with. Kind of the service, if you will. It wasn't up to us. We were training, as far as Los Niños or Villa was concerned, we were training them as nutrition and ecology, and later on microcredit, promoters, but at the same time we were encouraged or they were defined as far as what other priorities and what other needs are within those communities. And we would, what, we would try to support those particular initiatives. When you come to this side of the border, it's a different world, a different world in a sense because everything is pretty much controlled by those institutions. So therefore those promotores or promotoras that they have are very limited in that sense. They can't come out of that box, if you will. Whereas in Mexico, our experience was, we encourage them to come out of the box. We encourage them to, to, to address other issues other than nutrition and ecology. So okay. I think those are the main difference. Another, another big difference is also resources. Even here in the United States, although we're so limited in resources, in the Mexican side, they're twice as needed or twice as limited and therefore, because the resources are so limited, they are forced, forced or they are very open of working in coalitions. Whereas here in this side of the border, there's, there's, still, there's still that jealousy or there's still that competitive edge. Whereas even some organizations, some institutions, are, uh, they're, they're jealous of each other or won't work together because they're competing. They're competing for the, for, for the same quote unquote clients, if you will. So th that is part of the, that's part of the difference. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm clear and not confusing people, but that, that's my, my sense and that's my take. So Rigo, I, um, I think, you know, if you, if you were to uh, have a degree, it would be called uh, anthropology is what the degree would be. And that's what you should, you should be given a degree there, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it seems like a lot of time vocabulary becomes a problem, you know, and we trip over it and we don't have the words for the things that we that we mean or the things that we want to say. And so this term um, promotora or, you know, uh, health promotion worker, you know, as you said, is in this box in the U.S. But I'm wondering if you've if you've thought about other ways to refer to to that aspect of or that type of, of work beyond just um, 
community development specialist. That sounds, I don't know, a little bit too uh, formal, bureaucratic or something. I don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's some vocabulary around that uh, that you've thought about. Uh, the closest thing that we have come with, and, and really, uh, frankly, I haven't given it that much thought as far as a, a, a title, if you will. But I think that the term outreach worker is, is kind of like a, a, a closer term that, 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 that I've heard at least. Uh, that kind of that kind of identifies or or at least comes close to what an actual promotor does, at least in Latin America. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I hear, I, I've I also, heard you. Yeah, Elisa, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I very recently, yesterday, had a conversation with a woman who coordinates community-led development programs around the world. And I was actually speaking to her in Jerusalem, and. Um, we were talking about this very thing about language and how important it is for understanding systems that may not be sort of the usual systems. And the word that we were discussing was formation because um, in Spanish, if you talk about the formacion of someone, you're talking about that inner development of a, of a person, you know, and I mean, we may say human development, but it's not exactly that formation. I mean, it's sort of the formation of who you are. And so in this question about promotoras or promotores, um, the, the, the maybe possible translation is the formation of leaders. Yeah. But leadership then in the Spanish context has a real political sense. So it's really I kind of think of it as almost a support structure for wisdom keepers that, um, you know, do wonderful things in the community, often unheralded and often um, kind of behind the scenes type work that really is, you know, it, it provides all this network strength in, in the communities. And I do think that when we made the choice to move to Logan and we had already been working as the fiscal sponsor for the Chicano Park Group. And I think somewhere in that period of time, we also began being sponsors of the Friendship Park Group. And of course, those are people that are already quite formed in their activism or in their, their thinking, but they, the thing that VIA could provide was that fiscal support for these initiatives that were being carried out by community leaders. And um, so we've been, I think we've been the fiscal sponsor for, for um, the Chicano Park Steering Committee for almost 15 years now. So, and this is, yeah, Jim, go ahead, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm wondering also if, um, if, you know, I was fascinated when you talked about how, when you move this model to San Diego, then you've, you're dealing both with a U.S. context rather than a Mexican context, but also with the border is this whole other issue that gets in the way. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there are other institutes or other uh, organizations along the U.S.-Mexico border, perhaps, that you looked at. Is anybody doing something similar elsewhere in the border region, U.S.-Mexico border region, that you're aware of? Well, there are there are two sides of your question for me. One is the academic side and um, quite known is the Transborder Institute at the University of San Diego. Most of the work that they do, some of the work currently has more recently has been some training work in Mexico regarding um, legal systems and, but most of the work is research. And so there are many of those all along the border, all the way to Matamoros, you know. <laughs> but um, in the case of more community-based organizations, at one point there was a little cluster of groups that uh, we met every so often to discuss the issues of working cross-border. And that little group kind of fell apart um, over the years, but we and the other organization, Esperanza, were the only ones that were actually doing community-based work um, in the colonias. Most of the other organizations, they had their headquarters on the U.S. side, but really they were supporting 
you know, social programs, orphanages and on the Mexican side. And their concerns of being in this coalition were about how to conduct that work. A lot of it is real tricky. Fis fiscal aspects and legal aspects are, are tricky. But um, to my knowledge, there are especially binational organizations that are really both sides and trying to be kind of legal and relevant on both sides. So if I could sum up, uh, I've heard both of you use with a caveat that you mentioned, Elisa, about the concept, concept of leader or liderazgo in Mexico with sometimes attaches to formal institutions or politi you know, politicos, politicals elected and so forth. But I've heard you both use the phrase in Spanish, la formación de líderes comunitarios, the formation of community leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the idea that community leaders, uh, the wisdom keepers, uh, the people with the wisdom from within the community and the, the trust, the capital, social capital within the community to sustain projects of, of community development. Uh, yeah, it just plays out very differently. You know, the urgent needs may be very different from one colonia to the next, but they're certainly very different in a colonia of Mexicali versus, you know, the barrio of, of, bar, of you know, here in an urban setting in San Diego. So you have, and that to my mind is the great distinction. You've named it already, but, you know, institutes attached to universities tend to get, their agendas are typically driven, you know, a great, I'm, I'm a child of the university, a big fan of universities. <laughs> my father was a professor uh, for 40 years, but you know, their agendas are driven by, by the research agendas of faculty and the grant funding that flows to different projects and institutes within the university, right? And then community participants are recruited into those projects, some of which are straight research, but many of which have a wonderful community component, but the agenda is really driven by the, the academic institute. Mm -hmm. And where you all were prioritizing, you know, the agenda being driven from the community, from the base, the grassroots, we would say in English. And therefore, you ended up with a variety of projects, you know, it's not, it didn't always look the same. And, you know, I, and I've, I've been pressing you all to tell me, well, how does it work? Well, it, <laughs> it worked this way here and it worked that way there and it worked this way here and it worked that way there because each project ends up with its own organic evolution. Uh, so yeah, I'm just, is that, a, is that, a, am I capturing the, the kind of outline of things uh, accurately? Yes, and I think our, our, thought was that as an institute, as an educational sort of arm of the, of the organization, we would share our methodologies with others and you know, have done so for many years now, um, pretty openly and you know, without, without cost to others, I would say. Um, our curriculum for the development of leaders um, that was designed specifically in Mexico, um, is an open source document and, you know, has been used by others in different parts of the, of the country and different parts of actually Central America. And that curriculum, I, well, I emphasize the variety of its implementation. That curriculum does have phases, nutriacología and leadership or, you know, and then microcredit. So there is a flow or a stream of activities that that curriculum kind of charts. Is that correct? Well, in that career, I mean, we've used those programs. I'm going to let Rigo talk about that because he's great at describing it. But we've used those programs as examples. But actually, the curriculum itself is more about this development of the human being, mm -hmm. how to how to uh, coordinate a group, how to get along with other people, how to um, initiate, how to deal with conflict, how to um, deal with the obstacles to education that are confronting you that maybe your very own family that think, why would you go and do this certified program? Because, you know, who are you to do that? So, um, and I'll, I'll say one other thing and I'd like Rigo to talk a little more about how the programs connect, but um, I, there's one, a woman that graduated from that, that program. And I remember her saying, you know, I was a daughter, I was a wife, I was a mother, but now yo soy, now I am. And that's a very different um, intention of a program than, than most others. So maybe Rio, you can talk about how we've kind of used those programmatic aspects to contribute to the development. 
I think it's important to 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 acknowledge or at least realize that 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 uh, the 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 service per se or the need in the community. In our particular case, when we started this whole program, was primarily nutrition and ecology was kind of like our 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 vehicle, if you will. And essentially, that's what they are. It's just a vehicle, and the vehicle the vehicle could be something different in every colonia, like you say. Why? Because we don't identify what the issues are. And I keep stressing this. And, and I, I, try, I try to address this issue uh, uh, within the essay that, that you were talking about, John, as far as how, as outsiders, we might see the issues or the problems in the community from a very different perspective than the people that are actually live there. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, we have to be very sensitive to that as far as who are we? We might have the titles, we might have the degrees or whatever, but we don't live in those communities. Mm -hmm. They live in those communities. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very open and we, we need to be able to listen. And listen is a key element of, of, of part of this formation that Elisa was, was referring to. Sometimes we, we're not ready to listen or we don't wanna listen. And, 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 and that's kind of like the essence of all the work that we do, being sensitized in that, in that form. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to realize that whatever the vehicle is, that's all it is, it's a vehicle. It's the foot in the door, if you will, the foot in the door. Once the foot fits in the door, it gets in, then you start addressing or you start hearing what other issues what other issues, what other problems exist within the community and also being very realistic as far as how to address them. And maybe you as an outsider is not the proper person, but maybe you have the contacts, you have the connections, you have the networks mm -hmm. that could address those specific issues. So it's very important for us to, 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 to define our role, if you will, mm -hmm. define our role, who we are. This particular, in this particular community, these promotoras, are natural leaders. They will be doing this work, but nobody has, has acknowledged it or nobody has, has told them that, you know what, you're, you're a natural leader or you have a lot of potential because you're already organizing without even knowing that you're organizing. <laughs> and we have not named it, but I'll name it now that the vast preponderance of the uh, leaders who, with whom VIA has worked across the years have been women. Uh, yes. Yes, and so well, ninety-eight percent. Mm -hmm. So there is such a thing as a promotor, a, a male uh, community leader. The vast majority are promotoras because, especially women in these contexts, have not typically had their leadership recognized, mm -hmm. or uh, supported, or nurtured by the institutions and the culture around them, perhaps. And then I think that as this programming has evolved over these years, we also arrived to have a lovely location. Some of the folks listening here may have visited our offices in Barrio Logan in the Bread and Salt building. And uh, it has become kind of a community hub, not currently with COVID, but um, for many, many kind of local groups, they use that as a meeting space. I mean, we have the Lowrider Car, Car Council meets there, the Chicano Park Museum meets there, the steering committee of Chicano Park, um, even the Girl Scouts. So, <laughs> so the offices has become this support service, if you will, to these community groups. Um, we also, I think in this past near term have acknowledged that one of the purposes of being binational is to create relationships across the border. So we've hosted many more groups on the US side and young groups, groups of uh, schools and people and church groups and others um, to learn about the border and to engage with, with the borderlanders. And, um, and then, in, of course, in this time, we've seen the opportunity of doing some of what we're doing right now, which is online connections for people across borders. And um, I think we've been really, really uh, honored and, and grateful to have John join us this year. And start stewarding some of these programs, which includes, you know, the Escuela Amistad, where we have Spanish classes, and we've been doing um, 
the Charla Amigos, which is chats with friends across the border. And that specifically is with migrant people and um, people who've been deported. And you can practice your Spanish with them and also support their livelihood a bit. So I think that these um, new ways of engaging across the border are really the corner, kind of the cor cornerstone of the direction we've been going with the Borderlands Institute. Yeah, and as yeah, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, and I just I think this is so important. You know, from my perspective, um, you know, I've not been involved in community development organizing uh, in the past. You know, I'm an academic by training, um, but it's so important uh, to create this greater awareness of of the border and the border reality, and partly to counteract a lot of the stereotypes and the myths and the and the negative press that we're bombarded with constantly. And I'm just I'm wondering if if you know the things like the Charla Amigos and the and the Escuela Amistad and the Border Encuentro, these are really good efforts, I think, to try to overcome some of the some of the um, barriers that 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 exist that prevent people from being able to learn about uh, you know what is happening actually, really not what's in the newspapers on the U.S. side, but what's what's really going on. And I'm wondering if if there are other thoughts or ideas that you have about how this might this might be broadened i mean how it seems so important to me that that we in san diego we that live on this side of the border and and that that americans in general get a better grasp of the reality of what life is actually like and the and the kind of you know what we miss is the the warmth and the and the uh, grace and the and all of the uh you know, really positive aspects of, of Mexican culture and society. And I just, how do we break that down? I mean, what do we do to, break, to, to yeah. sort of create, you know, get rid of some of these barriers that stand in the way? I'll, uh, I'll, I'd like to comment on that and maybe we can use that as a springboard to opening the conversation to others in the Zoom room. We're right at that 1240 marker. And because Rigo and Elisa and I, as we've talked about this institute and the formation of community leadership, we have identified it's not a hard, fast rule, but in some respects, the kinds of a community initiatives that most uh, were pro most prominently identified in the colonias of Tijuana were really around, you know, the basic human needs, food uh, security, uh, you know, ac access to, to healthy foods, you know, hence the nutrition nutrition and ecology program as a point of entry. On the US side, oftentimes the presenting issues and the points of departure uh, revolved around culture and art and the identity of the, the Pueblos Fronterizos, the Borderlands Peoples, Chicano Park, the Lowrider Club, uh, Friendship Park, around the preservation of place and space and the culture of the borderlands, which is precisely that culture with which people outside of the area are almost always very, very unfamiliar, you know? They read about the border in the newspaper, and then if they get to come, as so many people do, through our travel programs, they're amazed at the culture because they've never gotten to experience it from afar. So uh, I would, the, the other thing I would link it to, Jim, and I'm interested to, this, you know, just this in my mind is precisely linked to the conversation that's now sweeping the nation about white racism. And the fact that we do not have a conversation, uh, active conversation, even here in San Diego, around white racism that has played out in historic and institutionalized ways in the borderlands. Uh, and the, the white racism as foundational to the oppression of Mexican, Chicano, indigenous and fronterizo peoples and the uh, challenges and the resistance uh, of those peoples to you know, white colonialism and white racism. So I think there's opportunities there uh, for future work We've talked about a cultural heritage collaborative linking Chicano Park and Friendship Park, for instance. We've talked about identity formation of, of Chicano students or Mexican American students, many of whom might go through schools without being foundationally introduced to their own cultural heritage. <clears throat> so I think there's work to be done both in terms of supporting the communities. 40% uh, of San Diegans are of Mexican ancestry, right? Uh, in San Diego County, I'm talking. So supporting those communities from within and then also engaging in this larger conversation around white racism and its legacy, its enduring legacy uh, here in the borderlands. I think that's some of the directions that I could certainly imagine our Borderlands Institute, you know, trying to push to, a, to the fore of public conversation. So there are many other directions we could go. I do wanna open it up though uh, and see if, uh, I know there have been a couple of questions in the chat room that we haven't uh, 
<laughs> lift it up. If anybody would like to lift their question up, I'll start scrolling through and I'm glad to do that as well. But if anybody would like to unmute and just uh, shout out a question, please do so. Uh, let's take these last uh, 15, 20 minutes and, and hear from you all. What, what were your hopes for a Borderlands Institute from VIA? Andrea, did I see you unmute? You did, you did. I even typed my response on a Word document before the meeting. <laughs> um, what, what about also learning from other parts of the border so that we are actually having a very um, kind of healthy relationship with our counterparts in El Paso and in Juarez? And, you know, I, I would be very interested in just kind of being in contact with our counter parts along the, along the border. And, uh, and the other thing is, um, I've always been intrigued by Israel and Palestine. And I know that a lot of border landers here from Tijuana and San Diego have actually been to, to Israel and to Palestine because there is a common um, solidarity opportunity there. So just my two cents in, in terms of what I would like to learn. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, and my, as you, Andrea and I have worked previously together, and, and this is such the challenge of building alliances and relationships along the length of the border is an enormous, enormous one. And many different institutions have tried. There are all kinds of challenges to doing that, not the least of which is just simple resources and capacity of the, the local organizations themselves. Uh, when organizations are fighting, you know, uh, you know, challenging fights on the, you know, right on the front lines all the time. The capacity and the energy and the the wherewithal to simply you know dedicate real time and energy to building those kinds of relationships. Interestingly, you know uh, the border wall. You know sometimes it's easier for everybody to be against something than to be for something. And and so there is quite a strong thick network of organizations that have organized uh, against the border wall, including in this most recent you know evolution. Um, but yeah, that, that connection of, of community development organizations across the border has been elusive, as you well know, Andre. I know you're you're more familiar with these networks than many of us ourselves. Um, and then the Israel-Palestine thing—I don't know, Rigo, Elisa, has Via ever uh, engaged with uh, Israeli-Palestinian fronterizos uh, and and or uh, engaged in that dialogue between different locations in the world? One of one of the groups that we host. Um generally, annually, this year not, but our groups that come from the USAID, the, the Agency for International Development, and they are sent from various places in the world, but one particular group that came from the Muslim world um, about a year and a half ago, uh, it was a group, a large group, I think maybe 90 people, something like that, and they um, came and spent time with us at Chicano Park and then we went down to Friendship Park. Actually, I think to meet John at that time and, yeah. and have an experience with them there. And there were two Palestinian women in that group who couldn't even look at the wall. They turned away and um, I you know, tried to encourage them. I said, well, you know, they've opened the gate. They're saying we can go through or whatever at the, at the fence. And the, the, the two women, one of them was, sobbing and she said she said no this is this is I, I can't believe this is exists somewhere else in the world because of the the fences and walls between you know Israel and Palestine a lot and, of the same um, a lot of the same technology in these walls right these are global companies and global strategies mm -hmm. that are so sometimes the walls look quite a lot alike in different parts of the world you know as they figured out what works or what they think works I think their wall is much worse than ours, as bad as ours is. I think that yeah. wall is the wall in the world. It's uh, yeah. The worst well, and I example. think it borders on a country that isn't even acknowledged as as yeah. a country. Yeah. So I had a guest at Friendship Park once. He was actually a bishop in our United Methodist Church, and he um, was equally overwhelmed by his visit. And on the bus ride back. He shared with me, uh, he was a Korean American, but had been born and raised in Korea, that when he was 10 years old, he woke up one morning and went to school and half of his classmates were gone because he had lived in one of the northernmost uh, you know, towns of what is presently South Korea. And when, the, when they you know, divided the country and, and created the demilitarized zone, half of the, his town was left on the northern side of the boundary. 
And he, he likewise had been home subsequently to visit his community where there are walls and that demilitarized zone. And to see it here in the United States was just uh, you know shattering for him. Mm -hmm. And it conjured, he shared with me, these memories of his childhood that he had in some ways you know, uh, repressed. Uh, very impactful. That, and it is a global yeah. phenomenon, as we all know, this global migration and this hardening of borders, right? This is a global strategy of the powerful, right? Back to Andrea's question also about connecting with people along the border. Uh, in March, one of the, um, one of the uh, people that will join us for one of these conversations is uh, Andrea Guerrero, who, who you may know, who's the executive director of Alliance San Diego. And has been one of the, uh, Alliance has been one of the main uh, sponsors of the Southern Border Communities Coalition, which has been working uh, with communities along the border to help develop uh, more humane migration policies and to uh, sort of uh, resist some of the, the actions of the Border Patrol and ICE and others. Um, so th that'll be an interesting conversation, I think, then. Also, if they have a new border vision that she wants to talk about, you may have seen yeah. this, it's available as well. Yeah, and those advocacy networks have, and Alliance San Diego has been instrumental in them and the Southern Border Communities Coalition. So, you know, communities along the length of the border have, have done some real important work in advocating for legislative change. Yeah. Uh, they've done some real important work in fighting against the border wall, as I've mentioned, but this, the grassroots community development is, has yeah. been proven elusive, I think, yeah. at, at least. Um, uh, Robert uh, Vivara shared, he, he hosted, uh, uh, the folks in Mexico hosted Representative Rashida Tlaib when she visited the, you know, Friendship Park and the Border Church, and she also immediately uh, conjured her uh, family relationships in Palestine and remarked how she feels so profoundly separated from her uh, beloved grandmother in Palestine and was impacted by the separation of the families at Friendship Park. So again, this kind of resonance uh, you know, for people in different contexts around the globe when they come to the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, interesting. I, I, I like yeah. to comment on that also. I, I mean, uh, not necessarily as far as the border, but as far as experiences. Uh, and you mentioned about El Paso. Uh, there is there is a strong correlation between San Diego and El Paso, specifically as in terms of uh, of the park, and in, in that particular case, Chicano Park. Actually, the uh, El Paso people from El Paso established their own park. It's called Lincoln Park, and uh, they they refer to it as Chicano Park too. And in in essence, uh, a lot of, a lot of the methodology as far as taking over the park, and also they're replicating a lot of the stuff that we've done here. As an example, the kiosk the, the kiosk that's right behind me, uh, we loaned them the the blueprints for 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 their kiosk in 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 El Paso. So there is that type of uh, there is that type of connection. There is that type of uh, communication uh, between different initiatives. I I just wanted to say that um, I remember a lot of conversations about the institute a long time ago with you, Rigo and Elisa, and a lot of other folks at Via. And I also recall we you know we weren't quite clear on what it would look like, uh, but it seemed to be it, uh, looking at our different stages and our strategies, it seemed to be almost like the apex, like we're, we're heading in that direction. We're going up that mountain. And I, I am just very happy to hear that, you know, we're, uh, or you <laughs> are, are at that place where you're really trying to give this shape now at such a critical moment in time and you spoke at least of wisdom keepers i think you know via has a lot of wisdom keepers <laughs> and and it is you know um really important that what you know institutionally um and as as humans uh is shared it's really very special information and um you know these are great learnings uh, uh for the many years i've been involved with via you know um i have some of some of it too and um i'm just very happy to see this come about yeah thank you Jeanette, and i appreciate this conversation because uh we are very much in an exploratory phase you know uh 
that we can talk with rather great precision about community development and global education because those are programs or, or initiatives that are well established and deeply rooted for many, many years. The Borderlands Institute really is, is, is continues to be is to coming into being. It's just sprouting, you know, up through the ground. So we very much relish conversation partners. And if anybody in this call or others would like to, to join in that conversation as we explore, you know, how to frame this work of ours uh, in this fashion, uh, especially I welcome, you know, we're all sharing the leadership here, but uh, Elisa Rigo really leads the community development work and, and Elisa continues to run the point on the global education. And uh, the Borderlands Institute is something I'm trying to spend special attention and time on. So if you'd like to join uh, us in conversation, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll connect you to others as well, of course. Um, I did wanna just ask Laura, Laura Silvan to comment. She meant, mentioned something in the chat room, but Laura, would you just say a word? I may even put you on the spot and because Laura is familiar with you know, initiatives on both sides of the border and cross-border work. And I'm curious to hear her comment on that. And then maybe I'll put her on the spot with a question, but. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's great being here and listening to everything and recalling some of the, the things that, that I'm listening to and that I briefly participated in in the past. And I, I was just commenting that, I mean, I, I think this concept of a Borderlands Institute is, is, is really, is really, is really right on. <laughs> it's really right on because um, there, there are. I was just saying in the chat. There's, there's clusters all over the place, all over the border, and particularly in this region of, of partnerships that have come together around very specific issues, like, um, like. Um, environment, like health, like uh, immigration. Um, I'm, I'm seeing Carol Clary here, who's a, a, a neighbor over here in a, in, a, in a community in Tijuana, but it's a neighborhood of many Americans who is now partnering with uh, Mexican groups around the issue of water, something so like super specific. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure if, if, if there were a Borderlands Institute um, that could just uncover and bring together and understand what these partnerships are doing, I think we'd be amazed. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, covering, I'm just looking, at, scanning the surface of it, and those that I know, but I'm sure there are just, numerous experiences that we could draw from for what we are doing, what we'd like to do, what we need to do yeah. across the border to become, you know, a, a shared single community. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, is this challenging question to, and Elisa mm -hmm. and Rigo began by talking about, you know, the concept of a hub. A hub, of course, that conversation immediately presumes that you're putting yourself at the center of something, which is always a delicate dance when there are many active and so many capable leaders and, and so many different networks. So that is another question I have, uh, not just to answer now, but just ongoing is, you know, what is you, VIA's unique contribution to this? If it's a, 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 an organic web of relationships, you know, uh, you know, what is VIA's unique contribution and what is a Borderlands Institute that VIA, I think Rigo and Elisa have spoken to it, you know, in terms of the historic vision of, you know, formation of líderes comunitarios, you know, formation of community leaders. Uh, but, you know, how does VIA fit in that landscape that you're describing, uh, Laudi, is one of the questions I still have. You know, I don't quite know exactly what, what VIA's specific role in that is, right? <laughs> well, so. I guess um, to to jump into the structural idea or the structural view, um, rather than a hub, really it's more like a network, a woven net, like an enlace of, of organ, like a, a network of organizations that are interconnected by various threads. Um, I think about uh, the organizations that, you know, you're speaking to the environmental organizations or the the groups that are working with indigenous peoples and, and even just get the spotlight on some of this work that's happening instead of the spotlight always being about the negative things that are happening. And then further, I think 
that really it comes down to, and I mean, if I had a dream vision for it, is that we would not, we would host innumerable organizations and groups to visit the border region and meet people, mm -hmm. meet real people, mm -hmm. people on the ground, people that are doing things, people that are mothers, people that are making wonderful tamales, whatever it is, but just that they would have that experience. And if it, ha if it can't be in person, then maybe we're gonna be doing more things like this, more digital programming and engaging people in a different way. But really to me, it's that spotlight piece um, because we're really, really missing the human connection and the, the, the spotlight on, on the good. On and, the good. and with that, I'll, I'll extend the invitation and make a special, uh, special <laughs> invitation to all of you who are, have been so involved in Via Voices. We are hosting this series of conversations in February called uh, Border Encuentros. And uh, if you, I, if uh, some of you may have already signed up, I'm just putting the link here in the chat room, but uh, you're welcome to, this at three Thursdays in a row. Uh, first Thursday is visit with the promotoras in some of the, uh, in a colonia in Tijuana. Second is with migrants and deportees uh, at Friendship Park. Third is with our muralists at, um, at uh, Friendship, at uh, Chicano Park, excuse me. But anyway, if you check that out, and if you'd like to attend, and and uh, and I, we don't want the cost to scare you off. So if for any reason you just say, oh, I don't feel like, you know, uh, please just drop me a line. I'll, I'll get you a coupon, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Um, but that's the link to to learn more about that, and and you'll be hearing more about it moving forward. I think I've even got an email blast going out maybe later today on it, so you'll hear more. But um, I want to thank everybody for this conversation, and just see are there any closing comments? Thanks, Laudi, Andrea, Jeanette for joining this last part of the conversation. Any other shout outs or announcements or final uh, words from the Zoom room? I think Carol. Did Carol have something? Carol, are you there? Yeah, I, I want to shout out uh, something that uh, Laura Salvani is um, involved in, and that is a community um, uh, initiative called Los Sauces, which is just across the border and it's a park. Uh, and it, uh, in there, the, the vision there is to build also a community develop, like a community room for education. And, and this is com completely a, um, a, an initiative by uh, Mexican citizens. And I'd also like to point out to everyone here that I, I live here in Mexico. And um, I'd like to point out that 10% of the population of Baja California are gringos. So. You know, there are initiatives going on that sometimes need to be wiser and sometimes need to be um, uh, supported. Some of them need to be supported so that they can be more, um, uh, how shall I say, Mexican centric. Yeah. And, um, and, and some of them need the support that only can, that only can come, for example, relationships, financial relationships, which come from the United States. Yeah. So uh, that's where I see VIA being very um, important because um, we do have a large community of people who live in, in Mexico that are uh, North Americans. So figuring yeah. out how to best support them to support their commu the communities in which they find themselves so yeah. that they are not just um, foreigners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Carol. Thank you. That's a helpful uh, reminder. And yeah, that's very much on our radar as well. These, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot over the last many, many months. I'm going to just bring everybody back in and just close out with a final comment that over many months, including last uh, fall, we were talking about a lot about identity formation and, you know, fronterizos and the cultures of the borderlands. But, you know, the gringo fronterizos or the aspiring fronterizos who are, you know, those of us who are aspiring fronterizos and gringos, you know, that, that's its own unique journey and uh, all challenges and, and blessings that attach to that, right? But uh, so much learning and so much growth that comes with that. And uh, it's always such a pleasure to meet other folks who are, you know, fellow travelers uh, for me. So thank you for, for your companionship, your solidarity, and that means a great deal to me. Um, and then let's uh, just look forward to the next uh, couple of weeks. So we'll be back next week with something related to global education 
I think uh, two weeks from now, Rigo has invited our, our friend, friend of Via Lucas Cruz, who will be talking about gentrification and, and the barrio in particular as a challenge of community development in that context. And then, uh, Jim, I know you've got a guest in a couple of weeks uh, for yeah, February. Yeah, this will be um, on the uh, challenges posed by uh, our large uh, school age population, which has one foot on each side and they go back and forth in terms of their uh, educational formation and, and what does that mean for schools in Tijuana and San Diego to yeah. deal with this uh, really significant challenge. Yeah, great. So you'll hear more about all that. You'll hear from me if you're, if, I think you all are on our list. That's probably how you got here. But if, if you're not getting the regular emails, feel free to just drop me a line. I'll add you to our list. Until then, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll sign off of Facebook and say hasta la próxima. <laughs>